Okay, let me go ahead and get my screens up. I'd like to thank Bert for the invitation to come back to keep giving these talks. Uh, this is a wonderful audience, especially for the talk I'm planning to give today. I regret that COVID has increased the world's interest in the history of epidemics. I had thought it was a niche topic mostly confined to historians of medicine. But now everyone has become interested and has created a wonderful opportunity for historians to try to engage wide audiences in these discussions. And there's no better audience than this for this than epidemiologists. I would like to say at the outset that, that what I'll be presenting today is work that I've done in collaboration with one of my friends and colleagues, Stefan Helmreich, from the Department of Anthropology at MIT, uh, who I see is on this call today. And so he will bail me out uh, if I run into any trouble here. Okay, so COVID, as everyone knows, has captured the world's attention this year and including many people from this department, Mark Lipsich, Michael Minna, Carolyn Bucky, Bill Hanage, and many others have really been on the forefront of leading this country's, and in many respects, the world's response to this pandemic. Many of my historian colleagues at Harvard has, have also engaged seriously with this epidemic over the past six months. Stephen Greenblatt and Joe Lepore have been busy writing in The New Yorker. My colleagues, Alan Brandt, Hannah Marcus, Evelyn Hammonds, and many others in history of science have, have also been publishing actively their thoughts on this epidemic. Everyone who has engaged with COVID has faced a common hazard, prediction. Everyone wants us to predict what will happen, and many of us are tempted to answer those calls. Mark Lipsitch went, led the way back in February with the forecast that by year's end, we're now about halfway there, 40 to 70 percent of the world's population will be infected by COVID. As you all know better than I do, epi epidemiological models have proliferated widely since that time uh, and have been criticized both for overestimating and underestimating the course of the epidemic. And that remains very much a work in progress. I, like many others, have had my own misadventure in prophesizing. Uh, I was asked in early March to write a piece for the New England Journal of Medicine. And at that time, and to be fair, this was published online March 12th, right before Massachusetts shut down. Uh, but at the time, I downplayed the threat of COVID. Uh, I pointed out there had been many recent pandemic scares, flu in 2006 and 2009, that had been overblown. SARS, MERS, and Ebola had all been contained without causing dire global mortality. At the time when I was writing, and COVID had caused 5,000 deaths in China total, heart disease in China alone was killing 5,000 people every day. Uh, so it seemed like COVID was relatively low on the list of the world's problems back in early March. At the time, there had not been any deaths in Massachusetts, uh, and I feared that the costs of an overreaction would be greater than the disease itself. Now, as you might imagine, I have many regrets about this with six months of hindsight. My first regret is that this idea about overreaction very quickly appeared in Fox News and then with President Trump. I don't know if they got the idea from me. I hope it was a case of independent discovery and not direct influence. Uh, but sure enough, it showed up in Trump's talking points very quickly in late March. <clears throat> My second regret in all this is that historians and other social scientists were not more outspoken about predicting the race disparities that have become a defining feature of this epidemic. As any historian of epidemics knows, race disparities have been the defining feature of every epidemic in this country going back for centuries. And so it should be no surprise that they have become so with COVID as well. I often wonder, had we warned more loudly that this would happen back in February or March, would some kind of early intervention have averted or stopped uh, the racist or racial structuring of this pandemic? Uh, I'm not sure, but I certainly regret that we did not make more noise about this at the time. And my third regret is that few or none of us predicted the complete failure of the U.S. response to this epidemic. Uh, I used to say, when people asked me about my bad prediction back in March, I used to say, no, who could have predicted how badly the U.S. would respond? After all, we have the wonders of the Centers for Disease Control. But over the summer, as I was doing my re background reading to prepare for my fall seminar on the history of epidemics, I was reminded time and time again that epidemic response has always been politicized in the United States. And that leadership in this country, whether it's mayors, or governors, or presidents, has often been terrible in the setting of epidemics. 
we should have been warning about this last winter. Any students of American history ought to have issued a warning saying we need to really watch out. Uh, this country has a long history of poor leadership and suboptimal response to epidemics. Um, and again, I'm not sure how much of a difference such a warning would have made. Historians, of course, like everyone else, continue to get asked to predict. Will there be a fall wave as there was with influenza in 1918? How might this epidemic end? I will leave these questions in the hands of those of you who are more able, uh, Mark and the rest of the crowd in this department. And today what I'd like to do is retreat from this world of prediction and return to historians' safer ground of description and analysis, focusing on the language and metaphors that are used in the setting of this epidemic and all others. Epidemiologists carefully select the words that they use, or maybe not so carefully, but certainly select the words that they use, especially in their co communications with po politicians, leaders, and the media. And their choices often have significant impact on public understanding. And this then influences the, how we respond to these epidemics. As I said, working with Stefan Helmreich, I've become especially interested in three of the words that show up most often in the setting of this, waves, forest fires, and herd immunity. The language of epidemic waves surfaced almost immediately in the COVID epidemic. When health officials from China published their first case report, about 425 cases back in January in the New England Journal of Medicine, they described these cases as the first wave of the epidemic. Even though China was quick to control the outbreak in Wuhan, in early March, experts feared that this was just a prelude. People worried that more waves or even a tsunami would wash over China in March or later in the spring. And this kind of language of wave, tsunami, out of control epidemics quickly popped up in the US as well, as you can see in countless editorials or political cartoons. This language itself isn't surprising at all. Epidemiologists and historians have long used the language of waves to describe epidemics, most famously with flu in 1918. You can find countless descriptions of the first wave in March 1918, the second wave in the fall, the third wave in the winter. Centers for Disease Control has this website about the waves of pandemic influenza at that time. And it's not just retrospective. In 1918 itself, wave imagery and wave language were widely used by people to describe what was happening to them in 1918. Now the language of waves and the imagery of waves are built deeply into epidemiological thinking and theory. I think I had actually mentioned this briefly in the first time I gave an epi department seminar several years ago talking about William Farr, but many people will trace the, the modern study of epidemics too far, who studied the British mortality data from the 1830s in order to identify what he saw as the natural laws that governed epidemics. He did not use the language of waves himself, but he did describe what we would call the bell-shaped curve that many acute epidemics follow. Cases would rise slowly, then more quickly, they would plateau, decline quickly, and then decline more slowly before stabilizing. <laughs> but even though many people point to far when they think about the history of waves, I do want to acknowledge two caveats, uh, issues that were raised um, after Stefan and I published our first piece back in June. First, the interest in the temporal patterns of epidemics obviously goes back much, much further in time than William Farr. Arabic physicians, for instance, were fascinated by the periodic patterns they saw with plague and other contagious diseases, and they theorized widely about <coughs> the causes of its periodicity, both natural and astrological. Emily Harrison, who has been working with Bert and myself on the history of epidemiology, has also tipped me off uh, to the work of uh, Thomas Malthus, uh, who, who described periodic oscillations between times of misery, meaning famine, and times of happiness or population growth. And his writing is full of water imagery, tides, currents, streams, and reservoirs. As Steph and I began to, to dig more deeply, trying to figure out where this first language of waves showed up, it turns out it wasn't in writings about these temporal patterns, but actually in writings about spatial patterns of epidemics. In the 1850s and 1860s, several distinct British colonial administrators working in different parts of the empire, so I suspect working independently of each other, 
saw geographic patterns in how epidemics spread throughout the British possessions. Outbreaks of fever often began in the south and the east, either in the Indian Ocean or in Brazil, uh, and then spread in what they called an epidemic wave or a pandemic wave across the globe British Empire. Uh, for instance, Robert Fawson, writing in 1861, talked about global oscillations of fevers. There seemed to be a series of waves generated in southern latitudes which flowed to the north or northwestward in succession. He named this the pandemic wave and had many different theories about what might cause these pandemic waves, linking them to global winds, uh, magnetic fields, and even environmental degradation. It was the work of another British epidemiologist, Arthur Ransom, uh, who returned to Farr's intuitions about temporal patterns and began to write about temporal waves of epidemics. As Ransom noted in 1883, the course of an epidemic disease through a country may aptly be compared to a wave, gradually rising and then falling with more or less regularity, again to rise after a period which varies indeed, but which, it, which in the same disease is sufficiently regular to entitle it to comparison with a wave upon an enraged sea. Now, if you look at the writings of people like Ransom and others, they use waves mostly as a descriptive term to capture what they were seeing in their graphs of cases over time. So it was a, it was a language used to describe this visual accounting mechanism of these plots of waves, of counts of cases going up and down. But it wasn't simply a description. It was also a prediction. They would produce plots like you can see here from Ransom's work of epidemics going up and down and up and down. And the assumption was they would continue to follow this pattern going forward. And so that would allow you some ability to pre predict the behavior of these epidemics. <clears throat> now this uptake of waves in epidemiology in the mid to late 19th century was part of a much broader uptake of wave theory throughout 19th century science. And this is a, a book that, from a book that Stefan Helmreich is working to finish. You can find waves showing up in all areas of science in meteorology, talking about waves of barometric pressure, waves of linguistic change, most famously in James Clerk Maxwell's wave theory of electricity and magnetism. And you could also find people plotting all sorts of other kinds of waves, whether in patterns of French rent or even the height of hemlines in European fashion. In the early 20th century, British epidemiologists again returned to Farr's intuitions and transformed them into a more mathematical rigor. Glasgow physician John Brownlee was struck by the symmetry of epidemic waves, and he believed that this rise and fall was driven largely by changes in virulence of the pathogen. So this wave-like pattern was some kind, of, some kind of internal logic of the bacteria or virus itself. Ronald Ross, who was fresh off winning the 1902 Nobel Prize for malaria, developed elaborate mathematical tools for studying epidemics a field of science he named pathometry. He worked with a mathematician, Hilda Hudson, who developed elaborate differential equations. And while Ross and Hudson did not use the language of waves themselves, their work is full of, the, full of graphs of waves, isolated waves, periodic waves, and turbulent patterns of complex epidemics. This work was further developed by Ogilvy Kermack and Anderson McKendrick, who had been a disciple of Ross's. They take the equations, develop them, and refine them in various ways, and produce what are now believed to be the first of the SIR compartment models that are in wide use by epidemiologists today. Much more elaborate, but the same basic structure of these compartment models dates back to the work of Kermick and McKendrick in the 1920s and the 1930s. Unlike Brownlee, who thought that the waveform was driven by changes in the virulence of the pathogen, Kermick and McKendrick believed that the waveform was driven, or the pattern of rise and fall, was driven by the loss of susceptible people in a population. An, ep an epidemic would increase until there were a few more, there were, until there were too few vulnerable people in the population to sustain the epidemic itself. And all of this work, in an interesting way, was in part a response to what had happened with the waves of influenza in 1918. This big push to develop the mathematical structure of epidemiology in Britain in the 1920s and 1930s was part of an ecological or an environmental turn in, in epidemiology away from the traditional focus on bacteriology 
and looking for in ecological models of the population dynamics of infectious disease. And historians have written a lot about how and why this happened in the 1920s and 1930s. <clears throat> After be being developed in this way, the wave-shaped curves and the language of waves have remained front and center in epidemiology uh, ever since that time. The waves do different kinds of work for different writers. Sometimes it's descriptive, as it had been going back to the work of Farr and others. Sometimes you'll find people writing suggestively about possible, possible causal understandings of what's going on here with some kind of intuitive notion that epidemics uh, are actual waves that propagate through a medium, the population, and that you can model these physical processes. And then most recently in COVID, what you see are the rhetorical uses of this language, uh, especially in the exhortations that everyone needs to work to flatten the wave or flatten the curve, which was so much a part of the coverage of COVID last spring. And you can see this showing up in various ways. So back in April, Mark Lipsitch and collaborators from Minnesota uh, authored this description of three future wave scenarios that were described by a Boston reporter as different seascapes of what might happen to us in the future. We might have oscillating outbreaks, there might be the arrival of a monster wave, or a persistent and roiling crisis that would continue into the future. And of course, none of these look exactly like what happened in the US or other countries, which is just a testimony to how difficult it is to predict anything with an epidemic like this. So when Stefan and I got interested about this last spring, uh, we wrote up a draft and shared it with Mark Lipsitch, very curious to hear what he would say uh, about this. <laughs> And he's always very thoughtful and reflective about his own work. And as he explained to us, he thought there were several useful things that the wave language did for epidemiologists. He thought that there was a useful, if loose, analogy between epidemics and waves. It's interesting to think of a population or an epidemic as a deformation of some sort uh, in a population that then rebounds back to its initial state. Uh, he believed that the SIR equations could model actual outbreaks quite well not just a single isolated outbreak, but if you add seasonal forcing, you can even get reasonably good predictions of periodic recurring outbreaks. And so there is this functional value in this language of waves. But he also did have concerns about some of the things that happen when you use this wave language uh, in a careless way, especially this notion that a wave is an irresistible natural force. Mark, like many others, has have emphasized that waves are actually very responsive to social action and social conditions. They're susceptible to be changed by our interventions. And so if you're going to use natural language like this, you need to be careful not to over-naturalize what is happening. And this variation, the fact or the lack of inevitability uh, can be seen quite clearly if you look at the New York Times plots or any others of the different trajectories this epidemic has taken in different countries. Uh, some countries have exhibited a nice bell-shaped rise and fall of the sort that William Farr would have been quite happy to see. But other countries have followed very different kinds of patterns uh, with rises, falls, resurgences, plateaus, spikes, all sorts of different patterns uh, in different places based on how the epidemic has interacted with the human societies. <clears throat> The US now famously has a, a biphasic waveform with one surge in April and another surge over the summer. And the New York Times last month uh, did the careful work of disaggregating all 50 states. And if you look at this, it's not a perfect pattern, but what you more or less see is two separate epidemics, two different rise and fall waves uh, in different parts of the country, more or less with the blue states having their epidemic wave in the spring and the red states having an epidemic wave over the summer. And of course, everyone anxious to see what happens this fall. Now, Mark also had another concern about the language of waves. In a way, a deeper concern that waves are something that dissipate. They have an origin, they spread out over time, and they go away. But that's not something built into the structure or the logic of epidemics. As Mark wrote back in May, epidemics are more like forest fires in the sense that if dry wood susceptibles are there, any spark can start the process again. The still equilibrium is stable for waves, 
and unstable for forest fires and epidemics. Now, Mark's mention of forest fires caught our attention. If you go back to the historical sources, you will see this language going back a very long way. Farr himself had written that smallpox spreads naturally like a conflagration. Ransom did this as well. He said epidemics could be modeled like a spark spreading in tinder. We did some quick digging uh, and have found how far back you can take this. This fire imagery, imagery is quite old. Uh, it shows up in Boccaccio's Decameron from the late 1340s. Uh, depending on the translation, you'll, he wrote this plague spread daily like a fire when it comes in contact with the large masses of combustibles. I tried briefly to come up with a more comprehensive history of this forest fire language for epidemics. And it turns out it's very hard to do. It's quite easy to search for epidemic waves or pandemic waves, but there's not a stable, consistent term search string that you can look for to try to find this fire imagery. If you poke around, you find a diversity of different kinds of use, usages. You can find discussions of epidemics, something like HIV, spreading like a forest fire back in the 1980s. But you can also find people writing about epidemics of forest fires, such like the West Coast is experiencing now. Or you can find discussions of forest fires leading to epidemics or outbreaks of pests, like spruce budworms and other things that thrive on the refuse after a forest fire. The most intriguing one I found was a letter written by Harvard philosopher and psychologist William James in 1903 about an epidemic of lynching. Uh, as James wrote, it is a lynching is a profound social disease spreading now like forest fire and certain to become permanently endemic in every corner of our country, north and south, unless heroic remedies are swiftly adopted to check it. Uh, so one of the things on my to-do list this fall is to tr track down Arthur Kleinman, uh, who is a great student of all things James, uh, and ask him for his take on this and how this fits into James's broader work. And just like the imagery of waves was all over popular coverage, you can see the imagery of fires as well. Uh, the New York Times has been daily updating its heat maps, uh, showing these red outbreaks of various uh, COVID clusters which look just like maps that the Forest Service makes of forest fires. <laughs> now the fires, of course, uh, do powerful work, powerful rhetorical work compared to waves. As Mark had said, waves are regular, predictable. They imply a return to equilibrium. Fires, in contrast, are volatile. It's a chaotic vision. The population is susceptible to a single spark. Uh, waves once generated, do not grow exponentially, fires and epidemics can. So in many ways, it's a much more frightening set of imagery. And of course, this over the summer, as the actual forest fire season intensified, you can see experts increasingly comparing COVID not to waves, but to forest fires. So, so Mike Osterholm had been a co-author with Marx on the, on the three seascape visions of the, wave, the future waves of COVID, uh, so here he was on Meet the Press on June 21st, uh, the night before at the Trump rally in Tulsa. Trump had said that the main problem with COVID was that the U.S. was testing too much, and that's why we had so many cases. Uh, Osterholm went on Meet the Press to say he didn't think testing was the problem, as he said, I think the epidemic is more like a forest fire. I'm not sure the influenza analogy applies anymore. I think that wherever there's wood to burn, this fire is going to burn. Now, of course, the language there uh, raises the third issue I want to discuss, this problem of herd immunity, this notion that as long as there are susceptibles, a fire will burn. As I mentioned earlier, this was the conclusion that Kermick and McKendrick had reached when they developed the first SIR models in the 1920s and 1930s. This pattern of rise and fall is driven not by changes in the virulence of the pathogen, but is driven by the emergence of a high percentage of people who are immune to the disease. And that's this notion of herd immunity. Now this phrase, again, which is relatively easy to trace, uh, unlike forest fires, the first occurrence that we have found was from 1916, uh, not in the epidemiological literature, but in the veterinary medicine literature from the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association. Now at the time, vets in the US were trying to manage outbreaks of what they called contagious abortion. 
uh, it's a form of brucellosis, which causes spontaneous miscarriage in cattle. And it had surpassed bovine tuberculosis in the 1910s to become the leading infectious threat uh, to the cattle herds in the US, both dairy and beef cattle. Most farmers confronted with contagious abortion destroyed, or worse, sold the affected cows to other farmers. Uh, Kansas veterinarian George Potter realized this was exactly the wrong thing to do. He had noted that most cows survive and recover, and when they recover, they then have subsequent immunity. And he believed that these were the most valuable members of any herd. Farmers needed to preserve those to produce what Potter called herd immunity. Uh, as he wrote in 1918, nicely mixing our metaphors, abortion disease may be likened to a fire, which, if new fuel is not constantly added, soon dies down. Herd immunity is developed, therefore, by retaining the immune cows, raising the calves, and avoiding the introduction of foreign cattle. And you can also see this language being used by vets in, to contain outbreaks of hog cholera in pig herds. Potter's usage jumps to the Atlantic in 1917 and 1920 in summaries of his work that are published in various British agricultural journals, and somehow gets picked up. It's not clear exactly how, but it gets picked up by British epidemiologists, uh, by Major Greenwood and some others. So at the time, and again, this was part of the post-influenza ecological turn in British epidemiology, Greenwood and others were doing studies of experimental outbreaks of an infectious disease in mice. So they would take a mice colony and then they would introduce various pathogens and see what would happen. So one of the researchers who was doing this work was bacteriologist William Copley. And he had noted that without the constant influx of susceptibles, any epidemic would end. And so in a 1923 article in the Journal of Hygiene, he described this as herd immunity. Copley suggested the parallel between these outbreaks in mice and what happened in humans especially human and children. As he wrote, such a likeness would seem to exist in the case of epide epidemic diseases affecting children of school age. Copley's idea was then picked up by Sheldon Dudley. Uh, Dudley was a professor at the Royal Naval Medical School uh, in Greenwich, England, uh, which was built or stood right next to a boarding school. The Royal Hospital School is mostly a school for the children of uh, British naval personnel. And he used his proximity to this school and its students to study outbreaks of diphtheria and other droplet-borne infections. He published a series of reports for the British Medical Research Council on diphtheria, scarlet fever, droplet infections, immunizations, and a series of other topics. And he saw clear parallels between Copley's work on mice and his own studies amongst the boys at Greenwich. Then in an article in 1924 in the journal Lancet, Dudley first applied the term herd immunity to humans. Now, if you look through Dudley's writing, he writes in a very odd way, at least to modern ears, about herds. For instance, in an article of his from 1929, he's writing about humans here. He said, nations may be divided into urban or rural herds, or we can, find the con or we can contrast the shorter going herd with the sailor herd. The herds dwelling in hospitals can be compared with those who live in mental hospitals. So he used the word herd just as many of us would use the word group or population. And one theory we have is that this was this language of comparing humans to other animals occurred more naturally uh, in the British context, where our colleague, a historian at MIT, Harriet Ritfo, has written about the ways in which animal thinking and animal language completely permeated British consciousness. And you can find people comparing aristocrats to find lineages of cattle, or the British working class to sheep who are supposed to be pliable and compliant. Uh, so it makes sense to us that Dudley would have this unproblematic use of herds to talk about humans in the setting of these long British traditions in which humans were always being compared to different kinds of animals. And his language in his photographs are often quite striking. Uh, he prefaced his 1934 report about diphtheria immunization with a series of photographs. One is a photograph that he titled The Human Herd, uh, which is the, the boys at the Greenwich School sitting down for dinner in their cavernous dining hall, uh, and they slept in equally cavernous uh, dormitories. Then he compared that to a photograph of the bacterial herd, cultures of diphtheria growing on this culture plate. Uh, 
Now, this first generation of herd immunity theorists never really agreed on what they meant by the term. Dudley was quite narrow in his usage. Uh, he believed that herd immunity was what happened when members of a population herd acquired resistance either from natural exposure or from immunization, which is quite close to modern usage. Topley, uh, who was the first to develop this in the modern sense, had a much more expansive concept that included social factors. And so for instance, Topley in the 1930s wrote that the English herd had herd immunity to plague and malaria because the English herd was no longer exposed to the vectors that transmitted those diseases. So it's a very different notion of what counted or not as herd immunity. So by the 1930s, you can see the language of herd immunity throughout uh, epidemiology texts, at least in the English speaking world, it would be a different project altogether to trace this in other languages, but you can see it in England, the United States, and Australia. But the usage of the term really takes off in the 1990s and especially the 2000s. Uh, we think in the setting of debates about vaccine policy and possibly in the setting of the resistance, of the emergence of significant vaccine resistance. You have public health officials arguing or encouraging what percent of a population needs to be immunized in order to achieve herd immunity. And then, as anyone who was following the early years, uh, early weeks of COVID will remember, this played out dramatically uh, last spring, especially in Europe. Uh, in early March, uh, pandemic advisors in England uh, publicly discussed pursuing a population uh, a policy of herd immunity something that would require, quote, a nice big epidemic. Uh, this created a furious backlash. Hundreds of scientists published an open letter to the British government calling this rec reckless, immoral, a fantasy. Uh, the government within days quickly backed down and denied that herd immunity had ever been part of their plan, even though many government officials had publicly stated that herd immunity was part of their plan. Sweden had made a more determined effort at herd immunity. Uh, one mathematician described it as a mad experiment or as Russian roulette, as he wrote, we are being herded like a flock of sheep towards disaster. By May, Sweden had much higher mortality than its Scandinavian neighbors and seems to have backed down. The debates, nonetheless, continued all summer. Officials at World Health Organization have repeatedly condemned any, her any policy based on the hope of achieving herd immunity. But some experts say it might actually be not so hard to get it. So there's this debate. Some experts will say that you need to get 60 to 70% of a population exposed to achieve herd immunity. No one is anywhere close to that. Uh, so this isn't a realistic policy to pursue. Too many people would have to die before we got there. But then you have other experts arguing based on notions of differential susceptibility that it's possible that herd immunity could be achieved at levels of just 20% population exposure, with it, with it, which is actually within reach for a variety of populations. And now there, there are vigorous debates going on amongst epidemiologists about what's going on in Sub-Saharan Africa. Many countries there have seen declining rates of COVID in the absence of significant public health interventions, even though the poor seroprevalence surveys that exist to just only five to 20% of the populations have been exposed. So people are wondering, is this enough in certain settings to generate herd immunity or not? The US had until recently showed little interest in all of this. Uh, and then just last week, the Washington Post reported that Trump's new pandemic advisor, Scott Atlas, uh, is a fan of herd immunity. He and Trump have both been using language very suggestive of herd immunity. But as it happened last spring in England, the White House quickly denied that herd immunity is part of US policy. Now, based on this long history, I'd be very surprised if the constituents of Trump's base, which famously values individualism and liberty, would be excited by any kind of policy that consigned them to herd status and sacrifice in pursuit of herd immunity. But the use of any of these terms really depends on the meanings ascribed to the language. Many of us sitting here in early September looking forward to the fall feel a sense of dread. In part, that's based on an analogy to the second wave of influenza that happened in fall 1918. Will we have a second wave here? Many European countries have started to have a second wave, uh, leaving those of us in Massachusetts or New York feeling that we may be overdue for our own second wave. Uh, other people are writing actively about 
There are concerns that COVID will continue to simmer uh, as long as there are susceptible people in this country and will burst up in forest fires this fall, the kind of thing that's happening on college campuses throughout the United States. And then others are wondering whether or not Americans will behave like obedient sheep and accept either restrictions required by social distancing or be willing to be vaccinated uh, when such vaccines become available uh, in hopes of inducing herd immunity in this country. Unfortunately, like so many of our current sources of stress in this country, uh, we're not going to know clearly what's going to happen with either the epidemic or its language until later this fall. And so I look forward to following this all very closely with each of you. Thank you, and I hope we now have time for questions and discussion.